How did I pull the short straw and have to watch this show? What's going on, Russell Talk friends and fans? Tempest is back with a review of WWE Elimination Chamber 2022 in about eight minutes? I don't know, let's shoot for eight minutes. Now the biggest news to come out of this show is the tease that Cody Rhodes might be returning to WWE television sooner than we might have thought, with The Miz saying that he needs to get a tag partner. The Miz had wrestled on the pre-show, losing to Rey Mysterio in about nine minutes in about a three out of five match, but Dominic Mysterio was taking shots throughout the match and taking a steel chair away from The Miz, which eventually led to Dominic being ejected from ringside. The whole match's babyface heel dynamic was kind of switched on its head because, well, the Miz is a heel, and he's getting double teamed by baby faces. That's not right. But during the main show, The Miz was being talked to backstage, and he said that he needed to get himself a tag team partner. Hmm, I wonder where he could have had one of those. Theories will continue to swirl regarding Cody Rhodes' return to WWE, although this one may not be the case, as PW Insider has reported that Miz's tag team partner will more than likely be Logan Paul. Yay. Regardless of who the Mrs. Tag Team partner ends up being, this tease does show that just about anything WWE does right now will result in people thinking Cody Rhodes is involved. But the actual premium live event opened up with the Universal Championship match as Roman Reigns took on Goldberg. Goldberg sold a lot more in this match than we're used to seeing, with Roman Reigns just kind of beating him up around the ring, with Goldberg occasionally firing up and hitting a spear before going for the jackhammer, only for Roman Reigns to counter that into the guillotine, which put Goldberg asleep, allowing Roman Reigns to the Universal Championship. I'm not gonna say that Roman Reigns and Goldberg doesn't feel like a big match, because it does, that's a big marquee match, but at the same time, I feel like the law of diminishing returns is starting to rear its head with Goldberg, as he keeps challenging for championships, and he hasn't won one in a few years, yet he keeps getting title shots, and I can only really see him get beat by Drew McIntyre, Bobby Lashley, Roman Reigns, so many times. That being said, this was a fairly solid six minute match, there wasn't a whole lot to it, they didn't mess anything up like some of Goldberg's other matches, but at the same time I didn't really feel the need for it. This gets a 3 out of 5, it wasn't bad. However, the next match was the Raw Women's Elimination Chamber match for a shot at the Raw Women's title at WrestleMania, as Bianca Belair, Liv Morgan, Dewdrop, Nikki A.S.H., Rhea Ripley, and the returning Alexa Bliss stepped inside the Elimination Chamber. Now this is a good point to bring up the biggest problem that existed on this show. There was no wrestling on this show. The first 40 minutes of this show only had 6 minutes of wrestling. Stick with this theme, you might hear about it again. Also, Alexa Bliss somehow had a swing in her pod. How did that get in there? Now, the other strange thing regarding both Elimination Chamber matches on this show was they were incredibly rushed. Most Elimination Chamber matches usually last somewhere between 25 and 35 minutes, with about four or five minute intervals between the pods opening. On this show, there were only two minute intervals, and these matches were just eliminations and entries. Both of these matches lasted less than 16 minutes, making them both the two shortest Elimination Chamber matches in history. Regarding the Women's Elimination Chamber match, there was some fun action early as Nikki A.S.H. started with Liv Morgan before Dewdrop and Rhea Ripley entered the match, with Rhea Ripley getting the first pin, eliminating Nikki A.S.H. Dewdrop was eliminated second by Liv Morgan as Alexa Bliss and then Bianca Belair entered the match, and then Liv Morgan was eliminated by Alexa Bliss before Rhea Ripley and Alexa Bliss were both eliminated by Bianca Belair. Now, if you're looking at this match in a vacuum, the match really wasn't that bad. They didn't mess up any spots. They had the right person win with Bianca Belair getting her WrestleMania title shot against Becky Lynch, hopefully making up for her treatment at SummerSlam, but there was just no music between the notes in this match. There wasn't enough time to properly illustrate any of the stories that they were telling, whether it be Rhea Ripley and Nikki A.S.H., and there really wasn't enough time to give each woman enough time to shine when you had to run through five eliminations in only 15 minutes. If this was just a regular six way match that happened to go 15 minutes, I probably wouldn't have thought anything of it, but because it was such a rushed elimination chamber match, it does kind of bring it down in my mind a little bit. That being said, they booked the right person to win and the match itself really wasn't that bad. It gets a 3 out of 5, but I'm not going to remember this as one of the great chamber matches. I will say one of the big positives on this show was the outfits they had all of the women wearing. Gone are the days of having everyone in big baggy t-shirts that really snapped me out of my suspension of disbelief. Here, they were all dressed like Power Rangers. You had the Pink Ranger, the Blue Ranger, the Black Ranger, the Britney Spears Ranger. In all seriousness, this was a big step up compared to what they usually have the women wearing. If they have to go to Saudi Arabia, I hope they dress them up like this more often. Then next we had the tag team match pitting Charlotte Flair and Sonya Deville against Naomi 
and Ronda Rousey with one hand kind of sort of not really tied behind her back. See, it's really easy to tie both your hands behind your back. You just like zip tie them together and put them behind your back like you're not getting out of that. But how they keep trying to tie one arm behind their back with like put it in a little noose type thing and then tie that to their waist Ronda Rousey just had her second arm just kind of like at her side the entire match. It was kind of funny. What wasn't funny was this match because they really didn't need to throw bells and whistles onto this. Having Ronda Rousey have one arm tied behind her back, this could have been just a three minute match where the baby faces got some shine and then Ronda Rousey killed Sonya Deville. We didn't need to see them get heat on Ronda Rousey. Now I know that I said that this show did not have a lot of wrestling and it sounds like I'm advocating that this match could have been a lot shorter, but I don't know. Take this nine minute match, make it a three minute match, take two of your chamber matches, make them both 20 minutes, and give some time to your actual tag team championship match. I'm getting ahead of myself. Both Naomi and Ronda Rousey came off as really big stars in this match. Naomi got an awesome entrance and she had a really good outfit as well. And they were able to get the win over the heel team with Ronda Rousey once again putting the arm bar on Sonya Deville. Another plus, Ronda Rousey didn't have her stupid pay-per-view makeup on. She looked like a human and not like an X-Men or something. That being said, I didn't think this match was terribly engaging. I don't know why Naomi would ever tag in her partner if her partner only had one arm and Ronda Rousey only having one arm was much more of a hindrance to this match than a benefit. I'm going to give this a two out of five and I really hope that we don't see a whole lot more like blindfold, hand tied behind your back, leg tied together matches. They're never good. Then next we had the false count anywhere matches. Drew McIntyre took on Madcap Moss. I don't think a lot of people were really looking forward to this match and they didn't do anything super memorable early until, oh my god! I I thought I had witnessed a death on this show. Yes, as Drew McIntyre went for a reverse Alabama slam, Madcap Moss tucked his chin and landed square on the top of his head. This was about the scariest bump I've seen someone in WWE take since I don't even know when. This had Steve Austin at SummerSlam written all over it, and thankfully, the word is that Madcap Moss is okay. Back to this match, Baron Corbin did a good job of kind of resetting everything, pulling Madcap Moss out of the ring when it was very clear he needed another second to compose himself before eventually they were able to continue on. And props to Madcap Moss, that sure would have taken me out. Drew McIntyre continued to throw Madcap Moss around the ring, eventually hitting the Claymore while holding a Claymore. Please stab someone with a sword eventually, otherwise why do you have it? I find it really hard to give this match a number rating when I watched a guy potentially come really close to a serious injury. It just feels weird. So I'm gonna leave this one out of things, but you probably don't need to go out of your way to see it. But then we had the Raw Women's Championship matches. Becky Lynch took on Lita. Now much of the anticipation for this match had kind of been sucked out of things even before the match had even started, with multiple reports and even quotes from Lita herself saying that she's not factored into plans after this show kind of makes it hard to think that she's going to win. That being said, Lita is my favorite women's wrestler of all time, and seeing her in a big championship match in 2022 is still pretty cool. Not only is it cool for fans to get to see her wrestle an entirely new generation of wrestlers, but it must be pretty cool for Lita to be in a big match like this at this point in her life and career, as well as Becky Lynch getting to face one of her heroes. Things may not be as polished as they would have been if this was a more current star who was in the ring every single week wrestling for months on end, but still, Lita and Becky Becky Lynch managed to pull off a really fun little match with plenty of near falls. Lita even got the chance to hit her big moonsault, even though the camera still wouldn't let us see it. One day, I hope someone finally gets the answer of why Kevin Dunn. That being said, Becky Lynch was able to pick up the win, and this was probably the most like straightforward, normal match on the show, and that was kind of a nice breath of fresh air compared to all the other nonsense that I've been watching. This gets a three out of five and was one of the better things on the show. And then, dear viewers, and then, you realize what happened next? We got 30 goddamn minutes of nothing. See, throughout this show, they'd been airing highlight packages and promo packages and Hall of Fame packages and a million video packages, one of which being The Undertaker's Hall of Fame induction video package. It's so long. <laughs> Where this really becomes an issue, however, is the next scheduled match was for the WWE SmackDown Tag Team Championships, but as the War Raiders made their way down to the ring, the Usos just decided they weren't gonna wrestle today. The Usos attacked the War Raiders on the ramp and they called off the match. Thanks, Eric. 
Thanks, Ivar. Enjoy your plane trip back. I have precisely zero idea why half the video packages on this show couldn't have been scrapped to give some time to what would have been a pretty good tag team match. So that's frustrating. The Usos and the War Raiders get a negative five out of five because this wasn't a match. And then what's really frustrating is the fact that they then threw to another video package. Again, might sound like nitpicking, but when you consider that from the end of the Becky Lynch Lita match to the start of the main event, there was 30 minutes of zero wrestling. And I checked, I I added up all these numbers myself because when I nitpick, I nitpick better than anybody. On the February 2nd Chicago episode of AEW Dynamite, you know, the one with CM Punk and MJF, that two hour show with plenty of commercials had more wrestling than this premium live event with no commercials. Unacceptable. And that really was the biggest takeaway I had from the show. For the most part, I was watching video packages and entrances as opposed to wrestling. And I don't know about you, but I would prefer some wrestling. However, that did take us to the main event as the WWE Championship was on the line in an Elimination Chamber match as Bobby Lashley defended against Riddle, Seth Rollins, Austin Theory, AJ Styles, and Bork Laser. This match is deserving of praise. Do not get me wrong, but I will get to that because first we had Bobby Lashley being taken out of the Elimination Chamber when Austin Theory was thrown into his pod and Bobby Lashley then had to enter concussion protocol. Now a part of me does like this because like actual sports, if you are suspected to have suffered a concussion in the middle of a hockey game or a football game, they pull you out of the game and you're not allowed to come back until you pass the protocol. That being said, I'm not sure how I feel about that if it's a work. False advertising is a real thing in WWE and I'm really not a big fan of it. If you had bought a ticket, I know that's not how this works on this show, but if one person had bought a ticket to see Bobby Lashley wrestle, they didn't get their money's worth when he was advertised to wrestle. That's kind of lame. And that goes double for anybody who wanted to see that tag match. You really didn't get your money's worth there. Riddle came out third, followed by AJ Styles fourth, and all the really good workers in this match put on a really fun performance, albeit not a very long one, as the light show to determine which pod was going to open next started and it flashed on Bobby Lashley's empty pod for Brock Lesnar to just say nope my turn joining the match now as he busted his way out like a caged gorilla to join the match. I love seeing Brock Lesnar throw smaller guys around and I probably will until the end of time. This is just so much fun to watch. I understand that Brock Lesnar is going to be main eventing Wrestlemania. That was pretty much a foregone conclusion but to think that the entire road to Wrestlemania is basically built around one match doesn't leave much for the rest of the roster. As soon as Brock Lesnar entered the match, he eliminated Seth Rollins, Riddle, AJ Styles in very quick fashion before it came down to him and Austin Theory. This last section of the match was the best thing on the entire show as Austin Theory panicking, scrambling, trying to get away from Brock Lesnar was about the most entertaining thing I'd seen all day. Austin Theory was able to hit a low blow and get a couple of decent near falls on Brock Lesnar, but we got one of the best Elimination Chamber moments of all time as Brock Lesnar hit a huge F five off the top of a pod, sending Austin Theory all the way down to the floor. Rest in peace to Austin Theory's knees. Brock Lesnar wins the WWE Championship and it will be a title for title match at WrestleMania against Roman Reigns. Boy, is that ever a mixed bag of feelings. A lot of WWE storytelling mechanics are being latched onto this match for WrestleMania and I don't think a lot is being left for the rest of the roster when you consider that the Universal Championship, WWE Championship, Royal Rumble match, and Elimination Chamber have all been used to promote just this one match. I think you could have used at least two of those things to try and build up some of the other matches like did this really need to be title for title i don't think so and even more so why have brock lesnar lose the title in the first place he had to lose it just to win it back from bobby lashley what does that say about bobby lashley's reign oh whatever but I think most people kind of figured this was the direction they were going, so it's hard to be too upset when you could see this train wreck coming from a mile away. Again, a 15 minute chamber match does feel really strange, albeit this was a good one with good performances and a hell of a spot from Brock Lesnar. I'm gonna give this a four out of five, although I feel really weird about it. And overall for this show, I didn't think this came anywhere close to matching the quality of Crown Jewel, and it wasn't quite as bad as many of the other Saudi Arabian pay-per-views, but that being said, I felt like this was about as by the numbers a WWE show as you can get. And this was a show that we were kind of expecting twists and turns on. We didn't get them. This show's gonna get a two out of five. I wasn't impressed. And that just about wraps it up for me. If you wanna hear more of my thoughts on Elimination Chamber, too bad. I never plan on talking about this show again. But if you wanna hear Luke Owen and Andy Datsun's thoughts on this show, you can check out the Russell Talk review over on Russell Talk Podcast later on tomorrow. And make sure you do that because, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Until then, take care, have a lovely weekend, and I'll see you next time. Mwah.